Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, probably very few of you have ever met me, so I'm Justin Wood. I've been working with Tim now for about 18 months and on this project for at least a year. So this next section, well, actually, this, the, this will be the bulk of the presentation today is where we want to go through not, not every single thing in the consultation paper, but most of the important design elements. Um, Carrying on from the introduction where Tim pointed out we made this decision in August to adopt that option B of a look ahead dispatch based real time pricing. So the fundamental design principle behind the design we're, we're presenting today that's in the consultation paper is that prices will be set in real time by the dispatch process that the system operator uses to run the power system. Uh, so that will mean that prices are struck every time the system operator issues new dispatch instructions from the dispatch schedule, and that will occur at least once every training period. Uh, up here, these, these are the red dots indicating the issuing of dispatch instructions. From that dispatch schedule, it, we will produce dispatch prices, and they will be set by the, you know, the interaction of generator offers uh, and nominated dispatch, or, or essentially dispatchable bids, then subsequently the interim price for the trading period will be determined immediately after the end of that trading period through some averaging process process um, and we'll look at what that one is a little later on as i've said these dispatch prices will come from the system operators existing real-time dispatch schedule rtd that solves automatically every five minutes However, the, the coordinators will make a decision as to whether or not and, and perhaps when to issue new instructions from that schedule. They can also elect for various reasons to run a, uh, another solve manually. That's the principal reason why these prices are not necessarily going to be issued on neat five minute boundaries. So you could have, um, in, in theory, you could just have one for the entire 30 minute period. So that's an important point to bear in mind when we get to how we'll deal with that in determining the interim price. Another key point is that prices take effect when they're actually visible, which will mean when they're published on WITS. So the fundamental design idea is that prices from the wholesale electricity market should be what you see is what you get. And that's fundamentally necessary in order to be able to react um, in response to those prices. Uh, as I said, the interim price will be calculated automatically and, and we're proposing that the clearing manager will take that task. Tim also mentioned that we, we, it's not in the code amendment proposal, but we have in mind to have essentially sort of a, a progressive rolling average that would be displayed on WITS or, or perhaps through um, alternative mechanisms that would just sort of project forward what the spot price for that trading period is likely to be. I meant to say, uh, we had, we had planned this material so that there were sort of specific break points where we'd stop and take questions. Um, in Auckland, a couple of days ago, we took questions from the floor, particularly in this section. Um, we're not entirely sure if that will work with this number of people, but if anyone does have any questions as we go along, please raise your hands, sing out, and we'll see if we can work that in. So, in order to strike prices in real time, that means that the real-time dispatch schedule must always, always be able to find a feasible dispatch solution. So first of all, we have a problem because SPD in solving that RTD cannot do that today. There will be infeasibilities or there may be other um, instances where some sort of manual intervention is necessary. Um, the system operator describes it by saying RTD is, is absolutely good enough to dispatch and run the power system, but it's not today set up to settle the market. And the key missing thing is that we need quantities and prices for every input. So whether that's generation or uh, as supply or load as demand, we need to have prices and quantities in order to settle that in real time through this dispatch process. Now, in other markets, whether or not they have capacity markets, this will essentially always be done with a price cap. Uh, because mathematically that means that the solution is sort of bounded, that there's always an answer. But we don't believe in price caps in New Zealand, so we're not intending to introduce one now. However, we do have this existing principle that scarcity pricing 
is necessary and should apply in the event of shortages to signal the value of that shortage and also importantly to give incentives for demand response as a way to avoid that shortage and in particular avoid um, forced low curtailment. So we regard this as essentially a win-win. Our solution is that we will ensure RTD can always solve by applying scarcity prices and we'll do that by assigning them in, as I'll show a little later, in three blocks by default to all load that is not otherwise bid explicitly by purchasers. The end result will be that all inputs will now have price and quantity, which means there's no more infeasibilities, no more manual interventions. Prices can always be struck in real time from the process used to run the power system. This next little section, what I want to do is um, outline the major design elements all up front, and then we'll progressively step through some of the details of those um, throughout the rest of the day. So we think it's really important to, to remember what it is that we have now, which is far, far from ideal. And in fact, New Zealand is the only <clears throat> major electricity market in the world that we're aware of where prices, you'll find out for sure what they are two days after the fact. So what, what do we have now and how would it change or what do we need to change in order to implement this real-time pricing design? As we know today, dispatch, the process of dispatch and settlement pricing are entirely separate processes. Uh, and in fact, you could also throw in there the indicative five minute prices. So reading from left, uh, the existing dispatchable demand product is currently dispatched from the non-response schedule, um, essentially 25 minutes ahead of the start of the trading period. And then within the trading period, I have, I've only drawn it as a single one, but there would be multiple normally. Um, <clears throat> the RTD will solve and the system operator would use, um, would use that schedule to issue a set of dispatch instructions um, at least once and on average six times roughly every five minutes throughout a trading period. Um, for those of you who put buttons for punishment are doing this for the second time, we didn't have this little um, graphic here uh, two days ago showing RTP as it, exists, as it exists today, which is these current indicative prices that actually are set using slightly different inputs on strict five minute boundaries. As Tim said before, it's only on a best endeavors basis. It's not necessarily all that accurate. Um, and in particular, it tends to be um, less accurate as the system's under stress, which is kind of the time when perhaps you need it the most. So perhaps unfortunately they are called RTPs, real time prices. Um, this is about the only time I'm going to mention them today, um, just to show that we're not relying on them. When I say RTP from here on out, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about this new design that we're proposing. Okay, so moving on, this is within the, the trading period. Um, those RTPs, if available, are the only price indicator you get <clears throat> in real time. Then we start the, the interim pricing process the next day. However, first of all, we need to deal with any of these um, provisional pricing situations that might arise. Um, so there's infeasibilities, of which there are many. Um, and I've shown the VIP out to the site here, the virtual reserve provider, without going into detail. Um, Murray can answer questions on that if anyone hasn't. Um, essentially, that deals with situations where there's a reserve deficit, infeasibility. <coughs> then the other three, SCADA situations, metering situations, high spring washer situations. And once, if any of those occur, you have a provisional pricing situation, there'll be manual intervention. Usually it's relaxing something to make this, make it all work out again, get a feasible solution. That price will become interim. <clears throat> ah, sorry, I should have said, uh, the inputs to this whole process are not the same inputs used in real time. They're um, metered demand information, which is more accurate, but it's certainly not um, as accurate as it could be. That comes from the grid operator and also from certain participants providing their metering inputs, um, one of those being dispatchable demand purchases. <clears throat> After prices go interim, a scarcity pricing situation could be declared. So if there was load shedding that was deemed to be at least iron and wide and in the absence of any transmission constraint, that would trigger this scarcity pricing process. Of course, you may not know that that was going to happen in real time. You're only going to find out after the fact. 
um, and under the code today, the generation weighted average price in the island would be scaled so that it's at least $10,000 a megawatt hour and no more than $20,000 a megawatt hour. And then finally, uh, essentially from the time interim pr prices go interim, someone can put in a manual error claim process. Um, if they did, that would have to be evaluated so there can be further delay. If no one claims, then the day after interim prices are struck, they become final. So um, I like the analogy, I think it was David Hunt's um, it's the equivalent of going to dinner at a restaurant, there's no prices on the menu and you find out what the bill is two days later. So that's what we have today, as I say, just, just remembering all of these manual interventions that substantially reduce certainty and your ability to trust and respond to those current indicative prices, assuming they're actually available at the time. Under the real-time pricing proposal, we're going to integrate dispatch and pricing settlement into a single process. <clears throat> so first of all, there'll be no more of these in Dickie. What? What happened there? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, first of all, there'll be no more of these current indicative five minute prices. That RTP, as it's known today, ceases to exist, and that's the last time I'm going to talk about it. Dispatchable demand, because everything must, must be done through the, through the RTD, through the dispatch schedule, dispatchable demand will now move to being dispatched along with every other resource as part of that um, RTD process. Scarcity pricing is, is as a separate post-processing mechanism, is entirely removed. And scarcity pricing, as I said before, becomes fundamentally integrated, fully integrated into the, uh, the real-time dispatch process as the mechanism to assign a price, essentially, to any load that isn't already given a price through a purchaser or, or their agent, perhaps, um, via an explicit bid. We also will have what's known as this reserve shortage CVP to deal with um, uh, the occasions when we might relax reserve cover temporarily. I'll just park that and I'll explain that more a bit later on. Uh, no more situations, no more separate pricing process the next day. Instead, we will now have RTD creating dispatch prices and they'll be published to WITS. And in fact, they take effect when they're seen on WITS as part of the act of issuing new dispatch instructions. Interim prices are then not a separate process. It's just a simple averaging function to derive a price for the 30 minute trading period from the set of all of the dispatch prices that were published in that period. Uh, so that interim price should be known essentially immediately, to just, just as long as it takes for that um, simple database calculation to occur. Now, if we retain a pricing error claim, and if we retain it as a manual process, then that will essentially look the same as it does today, that once prices go interim, you, you, you have uh, essentially a day to claim a pricing error, and if nobody does, then you know, we change the bulb and those interim prices become final the next day. That, that was the general overview. Um, now we'll step through more of the detail. Um, and it, it's not strictly put together this way, but I just thought it was useful to try and keep in mind three general themes of what, what we're gonna show you. Um, uh, Tim said this earlier, that there's a whole set of things that we don't need anymore. There are things that we have to change in order to make RTP work in, in the way we've proposed. And there are a few enhancements that we don't strictly need in order to make RTP work but we think they would strengthen the benefits and it's absolutely worthwhile doing that um, you know, while we've got the hood up, essentially. Just, just check in and see if there's any oh, questions. Sure. I don't know if this was yep. to be I thought people were going to sing out, but maybe not. Okay, no, that's cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, things that we don't need anymore. I've already said this, but there will be no more situations, no more high spring washes. High spring washes physically can, of course, still occur on the transmission system, but there's no need for any ex post after the fact intervention to restrain um, essentially the high price. Um, the prices would be limited by default through the scarcity pricing values being assigned to load. However, of course, um, they can be overridden through purchases putting in their own explicit demand bids, and then that would begin to act as a limit, either lower or higher or, or whatever their willingness to pay was. No more infeasibilities of any description. 
because they're removed by definition. They're removed by incorporating scarcity prices into the dispatch schedule. And so we've said RTD now has price and quantity um, values assigned for all of its inputs. No more metering situations because that information is not used in the dispatch process. No more SCADA situations, not because there could no, be no um, problem with SCADA information, but the dispatch process already has mechanisms to deal with that through the SCADA data validation process. You always have to have something to dispatch from. Um, so the system operator already has a predefined hierarchy of um, you know, best information to progressively less good information that they use in this circumstance. And it's not shown here, but one of the enhancements we're suggesting, we're proposing, is to actually include ion meter data as, which is much higher quality, and that will then supplant SCADA and be the first, the first one in that STV hierarchy. Um, scarcity pricing, once again, is now fully incorporated in the dispatch pro schedule. There's no longer any, any ex post mechanism. Hopefully, you should be able to see it coming, and you will know that those prices are real when they're struck through the dispatch schedule. Sure. Bruce Rogers from Orion. Um, you just see that in the bullet point up there, the metering isn't used in dispatch, and you see we're going to use ion metering. So I just yep. wanted to understand how those two things go together. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Murray handle that one. We've, we've got about two or three slides on that later on, but we got the first question out of the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, I'm James from Trustpower. Um, just for absolute clarity on the very first point, as I understand it, you're saying that, you know, well, you're not saying that spring washes won't continue to happen. They will, but it's the ex post adjustment downwards of the spring washes. Yep, that that's you're getting rid of. correct. Yep. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Or, or, or at least um, we no longer believe that any separate specific adjustment would be required to deal with a high spring washer because of the, the, the fundamental effect of having these scarcity prices and, and we would hope over time increasingly more um, voluntary demand bids that would have the same function of acting to restrain how high that price on the high end of the spring washer could be. <laughs> so, but if, if it were the case, unrealistically, but if it were the case there was no change in behaviour, then the spring washer prices would go higher than they would currently. Uh, so, sorry, just go on. Uh, I think it's important to note that the, the current high spring washer uh, relaxation factor isn't a guarantee of any price. True. Outcomes. True. Yep. It, it's, um, we like to characterise it as a, as a tire kick. So, when you've got currently the, the constraint violation penalties, which is your upper bound on pricing, the lowest one of those is currently a hundred thousand. And in a high spring washer, the most likely one to buy in is actually at half a million dollars. And so when you're in those very fine margins, the, the relationship between a megawatt of, of load either way, or a megawatt, sorry, of transmission capacity either way, and the pricing impacts being that it's unbound up to half a million dollars, it's a, the current process is a sensitivity test. Um, and as an example, the, the high spring washer yesterday, um, I think the original unrelaxed prices were around the $6,000 mark. The relaxation factor only took $500 off, or maybe $1,000 off the pricing. So the, the high spring washer as it is now isn't a guarantee of bringing prices down. It's a tire kick to see how sensitive the solution is to small. Given all of the inherent um, challenges with, with being 100% accurate and creating a schedule. It's a sensitivity tire kick and, and that's the end of it. Um, and putting, as Justin was saying, putting those prices of, at down at 10,000 limits the fact that you're not going up, you don't have the potential to go up to half a million. You're now putting a, a limit in which other people can put their own limits either side of that, as Justin said, based on their, their actual willingness to pay. Thanks, James. Oh, another one down the back. 
Darren Gilchrist from AG Fibre. Uh, just a question about um, the dispatchable demand. So you're actually getting the prices which are referenced to demand bids, and so that implies that that demand must be dispatchable. So are we going to be looking at pretty much anything that is actually has a defined bid is going to be dispatchable demand now? Uh, well, first of all, there is a little bit more information on that um, to come, uh, but uh, essentially the answer is no. Um, there's no more requirement under RTP than there is today. Um, we believe the incentives to become dispatchable should be greater. Um, and we're also trying to introduce uh, a sort of cut down form of dispatchable demand that um, is potentially less onerous that we would hope would encourage more dispatchable demand. But there is absolutely no requirement to, f for purchases to become dispatchable. The, the only d real impact is that for dispatch prices that will actually set the final price for the trading period, only dispatchable bids are able to set, well, only dispatchable bids are able to set those dispatch prices. Um, Non-dispatch bids from other parties um, will set prices in the PRS and that information in and of itself is valuable but if it flows through to real time only dispatchable bids can set the price which is essentially the same as it is today. Um, Chris Avers, Meridian Energy. Uh, just back to the high spring washer question. Has any quant been done as to what it would look like under the proposal versus what we have today in terms of pricing, because um, I, I, I pick your point up that you're keeping it at a value lower than the current 500k, but um, has, has anyone actually gone back and looked through the last 10 years and, and thought what this might end up resulting in? I don't, I don't believe so, specifically for the high spring washers. Um, Concept has done iron casting, uh, but they're just looking at a, a different, like a, a general pricing impact and not price for washing specifically. So um, I guess we're put it, put it in the, as, a, as a concern. Yep, um, in your we, we can look at doing that, and that analysis. Yeah. Okay. Can we look at it? I think another point just to add is, <coughs> I was actually about when the high spring washing orders were introduced, and I think they've been accurately characterised as a purpose. At the time, the amount that was relaxed or the, the constraint was increased, the limit on it, um, the relaxation basically, it was done to reflect conceptually the kind of level of metering error or, or inaccuracy that could give rise to high spring washer that wasn't genuine. Um, the other thing to take into account is the quality of the inputs into the RTD calculation are, are higher in, in real time than what they are in RTD predictive prices. So that kind of concern should also be less concern that you're getting a high spring washer that's more a, a factor of inaccurate inputs. The risk of that should be much lower. Yep, but, uh, but we can, interested in your feedback, we can certainly elaborate on those points in um, subsequent material. <coughs> Alan Holden from North Kisku. Um I just have a question regarding the meaning of bids and that is in an auction process, a bid is what someone's prepared to pay. Is that the authority's view of what the market would become? Or is a bid um, what someone is not prepared to pay? For example, in dispatchable demand, my interpretation of bids, and Norski is, I think, the only participant in it, a bid, from my perspective, is what we're not prepared to pay. I, I think that's, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Um, that the bid means I am prepared to pay up to this amount, if the price is at this amount or above, I'm out. That's that's too rich. I don't want to pay that. And that's the that's the benefit of being dispatchable is you you will know with certainty that you will receive an instruction that the price is either at or above your maximum willingness to pay, the most you're prepared to pay. Um, you will be dispatched off. You know that the price will either be at that point or higher, so you avoid the regret of um, only reacting to a price then it falls away and, ah, damn it, I, I would have preferred to consume more at that lower price. Yeah. The problem is, and I've 
hinted this to Murray earlier, is it seems in the market, the way the market's working for Norski is that, that mm, this batch bid where we don't, that we don't want to pay ends up becoming the, the price. And I think that's a market issue that we have. Uh, and, and potentially, if everybody was doing it, prices would end up rising to these, you know, these higher, higher prices. Uh, so, so well yeah, that there's an issue there, I think. With, without knowing perhaps the, the detail of, of this, I'd be very keen to see the specifics, but um, as I understood your description, that's the intent. That's what should happen. Um, if... No, sorry, the intent would not be... Uh, I don't think the intent is that uh, dispatchable bids end up setting the price. No, that, that is absolutely the intent. Is if, if they are marginal, and if there is no generator offer lower than that, or another dispatchable demand bid, at a lower price. So the final price, would it be the lowest of the offer and the bid, or would it be the greatest of the offer and the bid? Uh, it's the intersection of supply and demand. So uh, generally, prior to DD, you had a supply curve and you had a fixed load amount. So it was only ever where the load cut the supply curve. But when we introduce dispatchable demand, you actually put prices into the demand curve. And so it's the intersection of those two. So it, it has always, from, from day one, um, been able to put pressure, or put downward pressure on wholesale prices, not just by the reduction of load, but also by the load being able to, to set the price. So I think maybe we we better, as we said, having a, yeah, a, a bit would be offline. Uh, quite keen to talk to you on this further. Um, if we have time, I do have some slides that actually show those curves. Um, we can pull them up late, later on today if, if we have the time for that. But um, yeah, certainly keen to have discussion with you. Hi, uh, uh, Steve Torrance from NZX. I just have a question on uh, infeasibilities. At the moment, a lot of those are just driven by outage timings, not reflecting reality. Yeah. I imagine that would reduce under RTP because you're doing it on a five-minute schedule. But is there any prospect of um, of having outage timings not reflecting reality, and therefore you're exposing consumers at a particular node uh, to to those scarcity prices just because of a bo effectively a modelling error? No, no. So um, yes, we'll, we'll, we are well aware of that. There is a proposal, um, in fact, it's one of those areas where we have um, put forward something, but that we're interested in uh, alternative ideas to deal with those disconnected nodes and the potential for them to be misaligned with um, the dispatch schedule and the pricing boundaries. So Murray will talk about that later on in this um, detailed section. But um, just to flag that, no, we're not suggesting scarcity prices would apply in that kind of situation. Scarcity prices are intended to apply when the system operator must instruct emergency load shedding in real time to keep the lights on, to keep the system in balance. Um, we're not intending to use that to, um, for, for any other context. Um, but as I say, there will be more detail on, on that point a little later on. Uh, Alan again from Norsky, just coming back to the metering question. Um, we provide uh, SCADA data through one mechanism and we have revenue class meters for for another method, which we can't get access to, it's all it's sort of locked up. Yeah. Is, is there a proposal to take the better quality revenue ion meters and so forth and, and disclose those in real time to both participants and to the system operator and improve the metering uh, accuracy using revenue meter? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, we've got a slide or two on, on that later, but yes. Cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it, it's great to have all these questions. Uh, what I might do is move on because hopefully some of these, the next few slides will fill in some of these um, gaps as well. Uh, uh, it should be fairly obvious that there'd be no more separate final pricing schedule because there's no separate um, final pricing process any longer. And that would mean there's really no longer any role for a pricing manager. Um, the one sort of residual job would be to, to calculate these interim prices from that set of dispatch prices, but really that's uh, a fairly simple function mathematically. Um, so we've proposed that the clearing manager would take that on, and as I say, immediately that will be published onto WITS. Um, for any manual error claim process, uh, we'll discuss this later in more detail. We're also proposing that the system operator undertakes that role um, as opposed to the pricing manager now. 
Um, oh, well, I guess there's one little, oh, pointing over there. One little bit I said, I think this one is the last time I mentioned RTP. So um, <laughs> that, they'll be gone. We, 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 um, in fact, we, we did toy with trying to redefine the words real-time pricing in the code, but decided, no, that would just be way too confusing. So from, from here on out, they're struck and, and not, not included, even though this whole project is about real-time pricing. Uh, I probably said all this verbally, but I'll, I'll step through this anyway. So um, scarcity pricing would be fully incorporated into both the forecast and the dispatch schedules. Actually, I haven't spent too much time talking about um, the forecast schedules, uh, but other than to say they will be treated the same way as everything we're describing for the dispatch schedule, the dispatch process, with the obvious exception being um, the forecast schedules remain single forecast for the 30 minute trading period. So we're not proposing to introduce something more granular. Um, uh, right. These scarcity prices would be assigned by the system operator by default, keyword by default, to any load that's not explicitly bid by purchasers. We intend to use three blocks to do that. Uh, and those blocks will be bounded by the existing scarcity pricing values under the current code arrangements. So the lower bound being uh, $10,000 a megawatt hour and the upper being $20,000 a megawatt hour. We propose to, to split them using these three step functions. So the first 5%, again, proportionally of any unbid load would be assigned to $10,000 a megawatt hour uh, the final 80% at $20,000 and essentially that interim 15% step, we've just split the difference at $15,000. Um, we, we think this is actually uh, quite a good, in fact, quite innovative approach. Um, we're certainly very serious about using those numbers, but we're prepared to um, examine alternative suggestions or, or perhaps a, a different way of arranging those steps. But certainly we think this is a very good starting point. Um, just to really hammer this point, if these blocks are, now I said clear last time and got into trouble, so not fully scheduled or not, will not be fully supplied yeah. in, in um, real time, then that means they'll be marginal, they'll set the dispatch price, and that, that is the signal to the system operator to trigger an instructed emergency load shedding. That 5 and 15%, so this is 20%, was selected in part because we believe that reflects essentially the, the reasonable limit of um, the load management or the load control arrangements that um, distributors already have in place. Uh, now, why exactly are we proposing the 5% um, and then subsequently the 15%? It's really important to under understand that the first 5% block, what that would mean is that load shedding and the scarcity prices that are, that are driving it would sort of spread from that affected GXP to others in the affected region. Um, as you see today, for example, in the $500,000 deficit generation CVPs uh, in, as a form of infeasibility. Um, doing it this way also avoids shedding load entirely at sort of the first constrained GXP. So you avoid sort of hammering just that one location, um, if, which would be the case if you were to use a, a single block or, or a much larger initial proportion. Uh, it's also consistent with the fact that under the scarcity pricing arrangements today, which admittedly have not been triggered yet to date, um, the generation waiting for the average price, that has the effect of spreading um, those prices throughout the, well, the affected island. Um, and also that 5% of the national or the island-wide load is, is still quite a significant quantity. Um, the 15 and then the 80% blocks with their rising price value assigned is just reflecting the, the principle that um, you would shed your lowest value load first and as you need to reach out and grab more um, it's becoming more and more valuable so the cost should rise uh, reflecting the severity of the, the service that's being removed. Now this applies both for the forecast schedule so the NRS the non-response schedule and the PRS, the price response schedule, system operator assigns default scarcity pricing values to all load at every GXP that is not bid by a purchaser. The full details of that are well throughout the consultation paper, but in particular in that appendix, that large table showing the breakdown of the, um, the individual types. Um, 
Now, in the PRS, when I say bid, there's a, a range of bids that are applicable. Every bid counts in the PRS. That, that's kind of the point of the PRS. So that, that would include your full dispatchable demand bids, the ones that can later on flow through to actually setting the price, uh, as well as your non-dispatch bids that are required from purchases at non-conforming GXPs, and also difference bids, um, any, anything else that's not dispatchable is just sort of showing your intent, the way that you say you would react to price. Um, so that, would, that means that scarcity prices are only applied to any, anything else, anything that must still be forecast. For the NRS and the dispatch schedule, essentially they're treated the same. Scarcity prices are assigned to any forecast load and anything that's in a, uh, that's not a dispatch bid. So again, only dispatchable bids can set dispatch prices. Anything else is non-dispatch. Um, and, and one more time, this is using percentages, so it's proportional. If over time, more and more purchasers or, or their agents uh, are electing to bid their load at a GXP, in particular if it's dispatchable, the, the total volume of load assigned to that 5%, 15%, 80% would, would progressively reduce. And in theory, you could get to the point where all load is bid in explicitly and there is no such thing as any default scarcity pricing value at that location, which would be entirely efficient because then you would have the, the actual costs and the willingness to pay from generators and purchasers all revealed directly into the market mechanism.